real life pehle uh, namaste okay thank you doctor so can i change the uh, like uh, yes, should can. i should i be the host or should i recline you from the host doctor also yeah you are host now okay thank you um shuru garum sir garum get one going sir uh screen share garun ma powerpoint ha sir हाँ जो स्क्रीन सेल करने को हैं सर करें हैं सर हाँ जो दे मोफोस में की बैकग्राउंड बन सकते हैं यानी अच्छा गुड ओके आस गुड इवनिंग एवरीवन फर्स्ट ऑफ़ ऑल आई लाइक टू वेलकम यू ऑल इन बीएनबी अल्युमिनाय स्पाइन वेबिनार थर्टीन बीएनबी अल्युमिनाय स्पाइन स्टडी ग्रुप इज़ अ ग्रुप ऑफ़ स्पाइन सर्जन्स who completed their post graduate uh, degree from bnb hospital and hrdc under kathmandu university we were trained uh, under supervision of professor ashok kumar banskota professor jawala raspande and associate professor babu kaji shrestha and we all are proud to be their student professor banskota is a father like figure for us so we all call him ba ba is a source of inspiration a role model which we all aspire to be when we we were in training he always used to tell us that we should try to be a good human being despite being a great personality he is so humble to us others one thing i always remember what he always used to say is we are not producing orthopedic surgeons but we are producing leaders and i hope every one of us uh, has always tried to be so his contribution in the field of orthopedic surgery and also to our society and whole country can be expressed in few minutes yet i see is the glaring example of what he has created with lots of struggle for which he is awarded prestigious awards like world of children award which is considered as nobel prize in the field of child advocacy and also star award and many more bnb hospital is another leading hospital which was established by him and is considered as a number one tertiary care center for orthopedic trauma in nepal with probably the largest number of surgeons working as a team under his supervision uh if i keep on speaking i can speak whole night about him he learned uh he taught uh, we learned uh, everything about orthopedics from him and today we will uh, we'll learn more about life struggle stress and the spiritual aspects which we may not learn from any textbooks or journals after bas talk we'll have interactive session moderated by spine surgeon dr binod bujukse who is one of the students of pa so i would like to request everyone to put your questions in the chat box and to cheer the session we have dr sanjeev upreti who is one of the first orthopedic surgeons produced by ba before moving to us ba's talk i would like uh, uh, all the participants to remain mute and switch off the video to avoid the unnecessary disturbances and now with permission from chairperson i would like to request ba to deliver his talk thank you Thank you. So please go ahead. Good evening, everyone. This is a laudable effort by the BNB HRDC Alumni Spine Group. This initiation of the CME webinars it makes me proud. Dr. Rajesh Choudhury requested me for an inspirational talk, and along with the BNB and Spine Unit, has been successful to coax me to participate. my life's inspiration and pole star being my gurudev paramahamsa yogananda i have based my talk on information that i have uh, liberally accrued from his teachings the shortcomings are all mine jay gurudev since this topic that i have chosen is about love love means many things for different people gurudev paramahamsa yogananda has described love as a continuous flowing river which through sincere humble souls bypassing selfish sense bound ones he also states that love is like a golden mansion in which the king of eternity 
becomes the entire family of creation. Mahatma Gandhi in recent past exemplified the power of love at work, winning the hearts of millions during the freedom struggle of India. The heart is a powerful generator of love that each individual carries besides pumping tons of blood to perfuse the tissues, it is capable of generating the energy of love. Share full slide one minute, sir. Kaan Hira Sir is the author team. New share of presenter's view, my Hira. Share full slide one again. Can you see what I did? I'm going to TV. You have to go to display settings up there. Okay, display settings and then? Yeah, just click the drop down. Yeah, uh -huh. duplicate slideshow. Duplicate slideshow. Done? You have to click it. Yeah, yeah go full screen now. Bye, bye. Hey. Love. Yes, perfect. Okay. As I was just saying, the heart is a very powerful generator of love that each individual carries. And besides pumping tons of blood to perfuse tissues, it is capable of generating the energy of love. It sits just in front of the thoracic spinal center or the anaha chakra, which is the center of divine love. Love may exist in presence of passion, but when passion is mistaken for love, it just melts away. Love is a mystic fire that can melt the grossness of the cosmos into the invisible substance of eternal love. Genuine happiness is possible only when love prevails. We must thus entertain positive thoughts, broadcast loving vibrations to all, even those who misunderstand us. We must simplify life, make effort to help those who are in need. This is a great man. He was a scientist, a physicist, but was also a very deeply spiritual person. And this famous statement of his, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind, is extremely practical and meaningful. He was an admirer of Mahatma Gandhi. During his last moments of life, he was rushed to the Princeton University Hospital where they diagnosed him to have a aortic aneurysm that was leaking. And he reminisced, thought it over and told the doctors that He's lived a good life, his time has come, and he said, I want to die peacefully. So he had actually transcended these boundaries of physical realms and knew what to expect, and he died peacefully after a few days of admission to the hospital. Now, one of his daughters, Lysel, was very close to Albert Einstein, and he wrote her a letter in 1938 and he said that mo most of the contents of this letter that I am writing to you, humanity at this moment is not prepared for. He talked a lot about his famous equation. He talked about the unified field of theory and uh, he said probably you shouldn't be in a hurry to release the contents of this letter. So finally in 1980, the letter was released and what were his concerns? He said at the time that humanity was not ready for the true meaning behind this unified field theory. He speculated that only a few understood what he really meant to say. And he boldly stated that there exists a powerful force that science has not discovered. And he said, it is the power of love. This is my Guruji Paramahamsa Yogananda Ji. He was once standing on a huge marble floor and a momentary thought 
actually flashed into his mind that does this marble have energy? Does it live? And the whole floor trembled. So what does that mean? We know that every atom in creation is endorsed with energy. He once stated in a lecture that a gram of human flesh has enough energy to light a city, <coughs> large city like Chicago for one week. And we know that now all matter is in fact energy in different states of vibration. All the inner developments in atomic energy sciences that have occurred over the past you know, decades testify to these facts. <coughs> This is, the equation. Ah. This, is a, this is the famous equation of Albert Einstein. I should have actually just stated a few uh, statements about this famous equation. It says that energy and matter are interconvertible. Energy equals the mass of any substance into the square of the speed of light. So what this means is that if mass can expand infinitely, it is present everywhere. And divine love can expand and be more and more powerful only if you can expand your consciousness. Now, just substitute in this formula, energy equals consciousness into the square of the speed of light. What does that mean? It means that the consciousness becomes omnipresent, it becomes omniscient, and you expand with divine love. These are all godlike qualities that have been demonstrated by seers and realized souls in the past. That is why what we call miracles, by location, you know, seers, people, realized persons being able to be present at the same multiple places at the same time. Uh, these are qualities that each human being has the potential to achieve if he can master the science of yoga and achieve infinite expansion. So these are the points that I told you, omnipresence, omniscience, cosmic consciousness and expansion of divine love. Now, Substitute in this formula now consciousness for love. So when love becomes converted into energy, it becomes infinite, infinite divine love. So it encompasses all things in manifestation and beyond. This expanded love is so powerful that it conquers everything. This vortex just shows, it is a uh, illustration of what Einstein speculated in his famous formula. He stated that expanded love conquers all. It is a variable that humanity has ignored for too long. He found that these gigantic concepts that he realized and illustrated in his formula are equated in the sense that love is light, love is gravity, love is the power that multiplies the best we have. Love is God and God is love. My guru, Paramahamsa Yogananda, had a premonition about when he was going to leave his body and his disciples were extremely concerned about how his work was going to go on in his physical absence. And he looked at them and he said, when I am gone, only love can take my place. He said, give this love to all and be so drunk with it that this love can be transmitted to all. Some of you may recognize this. This is the road in the thinker. He's resting his chin on his hands. He's got a frown on his forehead and he's got his eyes closed. So when we think, we strive to go beyond our usual five senses. 
we frown, we close our eyes, we wrinkle at the brows, and possibly we're directing life trons to the frontal lobe of the brain. So in this manner, when we think deeply, we sometimes get impressions that we are more than our physical selves. This effort is a must for all individuals. Isaac Newton is the famous physicist who was a great thinker and he never married. He postulated the laws of motion and gravity and great discoveries and inventions and works of art made by individuals like uh, Newton are possible because they are able to dip into the superconscious realms, which are the storehouse of all knowledge. And in those moments, they are able to discover things that intuitive reasoning. Normally we say, well, this is, uh, there is a all clo one crow is black, two crows are black, all crows are black. So all crows must be black everywhere. So that is intuitive reasoning. So these are intuitive reasoning is limited by our senses. The sixth sense is intuition for which you must actually practice, go beyond and try to contact your higher consciousness. So in the awake state, our five senses are at work. When we go to sleep, the body is disengaged and it, why we fall revivified after a sleep because we connect with our astral body, which is uh, charged with cosmic energy. That's why sleep is so restful. So when we sleep, we dream and we are not aware of our physical body. When you wake up again, you say, well, I am the body. So in the superconscious uh, state, the five senses are disengaged and the person is actually working with his intuition. If you have developed intuition perfectly, it is infallible. It leads you to that deep storehouse of cosmic knowledge, love and energy. So when you are able to enter the state of com cosmic consciousness, this is oneness with cosmic love, with all in creation and beyond. The human body is a precious gift, which we receive, you know, after 8 million years of other forms of life, starting from a multicellular organism to plant life and animal, some different. But finally, so you get a human body, which is a very, very precious gift. Now, the physical body actually, if you are able to break it into its you know, constituents, is composed mostly of water. And the remaining 10% you know, or so of material, if you broke it down into its constituents, you could go to a market and purchase those constituents for less than 100 rupees. So it's amazing that how all these you know, constituents are amalgamated to form a wonderful machine like the human body. So, but what happens is we fail to realize the purpose of why we have been given this gift of a human body. The human body has been given to realize that we are not mortal, but immortal. And the human body is gifted with a astral body in which the cerebrospinal axis is charged with prana and you have channels of energy that have to be gently worked up to achieve consciousness to a state where you connect with the cosmic consciousness. So until we are able to achieve that, we are actually forced to live by the law of karma. You know, what we do, every thought we entertain, every activity that we do has got a bad or a negative effect that we carry from one life to another. And until we realize that we are immortal divine souls through you know, practice of some you know, life control techniques that yoga provides, we will be actually in this cycle of birth and death. 
this cycle of birth and death is described very ably by a great sage whose name is Swami Sri Yukteswar. He actually is the guru of Paramahamsa Yogananda Ji, our guru, you know. And Sri Yukteswar Ji is uh, considered the Gyan Avatar, the Avatar of knowledge. And he was able to expound that the cycles of yugas are have a descending and ascending form in which consciousness goes away from the grand center and consciousness slowly declines and then slowly after it reaches a certain point the consciousness slowly attends towards the grand center what is this grand center it is a center with uh, center everywhere circumference nowhere it is infinity defined like that so these yuga cycles continue in this form till we are able to finally realize our immortal nature. When we, the physical human body is a body which actually reflects vibrations and these vibrations can be very peaceful vibrations, they can be revengeful vibrations, they can be fearful vibrations, they can be loving vibrations. A beautiful story about Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji in his ashram in Puri, where he was you know, standing in his courtyard with a couple of disciples when a cobra came, you know, slithering towards him with his hood up like this. Swami Ji didn't move. He just clapped his hands and the cobra that had its hood up and ready to strike slowly, you know, fell and it slowly slithered between his legs and went away. So with his peaceful, loving vibrations, he was able to calm the snake and uh, allow it to go its way. So this is an example, you know, as human beings dependent on our environment, dependent on the way we live, dependent on the company we keep, dependent on the food we eat, and so all these things create all kinds of vibrations that we pass on to other people. So there is a great uh, uh, relationship between breathing and you know stillness and uh, consciousness. We know that uh, some uh, animals live for short period of time, some like a dog lives for 15, 20 years, some exceptionally for a few years longer. A crocodile, which breathes for four or five times a minute, lives most of the times to an age of over 100 years. Certain species of tortoise have been known to live for you know 300 years. So a tortoise breathes hardly once or twice every minute. So. This is a uh, very interesting phenomenon which the sages of India, the masters uh, who were able to master yoga, realized they said there is some relationship between life and breath. And they were able to discover that the breath is the cord that connects the human body with the higher forms of consciousness. And if you are able to consciously, you know, achieve a state of breathlessness by the practice of special types of pranayam, you can actually achieve deathless states. So, the, for some of the organizers of this particular webinar are, you know, my students who do spine work. So, all of you are familiar with, you know, the anatomical structures of the spine, the vertebral structure, the ligaments, the nervous systems, but your eyes don't see actually the astral spine, which is a very, very intricate structure. And these are powerhouses of energy where the practice of yoga in the correct way channels energies into the brain or the Sahasrara Chakra. The spine if you take a cross section in of the astral spine, you know it, we know that the spine 
as it's you know bony elements the spinal cord but beyond that in the astral spine we hear textbooks talk about ida pingala sushumna and then interior to the sushumna is the uh, chitra and inside the chitra is what is called the brahmanadi you know this is a thin very very fine thread like you know tube through which consciousness flows and in the practice of the type of yoga you know taught by yogoda satsang society of india and self realization fellowship which was established our by our guru paramahamsa yogananda the yoga is kriya yoga that is what is taught there it is energy channelization in the cerebrospinal axis and gradually working that energy to the higher centers in the upper spine and the brain This is a story about a great saint. His name is Trilanya Swami. He spent the at least the latter part of his life in Varanasi, and he is he uh, was very obese. He didn't wear any clothes. He exuded love to all. He behaved like a little child. He angered no one. He had a full mastery of life, and. people used to observe him you know for hours submerged on the ganges there is a story of a uh, you know fake devotee who came to him and thought he would teach this sage a lesson so he said swami ji i brought you you know clabbered milk and you know uh, for you to eat clabbered milk is um, uh, uh, indian sweet you know made from milk so actually it was a mixture of lime and water that he had brought you know so the swami drank that without any uh, external you know grimacing and after he drank it the person who brought this to poison him started to feel all the pain and was in great torment and the swami said see we are all connected i have you know my soul feels for your soul you know so you try to actually poison me but you are suffering that uh, the after effects of this you know negative action so he actually lived for nearly 300 years there are a lot of interesting stories about this swami but since uh, so much is documented in books about him i thought he would make a good story so this is the bhagavad gita which is our hindu bible and it has many many types of translations and this particular translation is a large two volume book which is the interpretation given by our guru and this particular shlok in chapter 429 says apane juhati pranam prade pani tatha pare prada pan gati rudva pranayama parayana what this means is offering the inhaling breath into the exhaling breath and offering the exhaling breath into the inhaling breath the yogi neutralizes both breaths so this is actually a summary of kriya yoga practice you know when you do this special pranayam practice it for years sometimes for incarnations you know you gradually reach a state where you decarbonize your blood and there comes a state when there is no need for oxygen to purify the pure blood anymore when that state is reached the heart stops you stop breathing and you reach a state of perfect stillness and your consciousness expands now these are outline of gurus about you have mahaavtar baba ji you have lahiri mahashay you have swami sri pteshwar ji and paramahamsa yogananand ji these are all realized masters they are ever living in omnipresence and these are the line of gurus who have established this teaching of yogoda satsang society fellowship which is headquartered in uh, los angeles united states so they have 
summarized and brought all the positive aspects of practical yoga that everybody can institute in their daily lives. These gurus have fulfilled all the gigantic conceptions of Albert Einstein. They are able to convert their bodies into energy. They are able to materialize and dematerialize their bodies. There are examples of exalted souls who have actually seen and experienced these masters materializing and dematerializing. So they have fulfilled all those gigantic concepts theorized by Albert Einstein in his famous formula. They are omnipresent vehicles of divine love and wisdom. Mahatma Babaji, he appeared in one of the saints and his famous statement was, he said, you know, only love, he said, my nature is love. That's what humanity should practice and share. Paramahamsa Yoga, I already told you in the beginning, stated that only love can take my place. So, the consciousness that opens up is like this little bud. You know, our spine has centers which are petals. The petals are downward turned and with practice, with, you know, following all the eightfold paths of Patanjali, you know, leading a regular life, doing your work in the world, being in the world, but not of the world. That's the world. This is how your you know, spinal petals gradually open and blossom into a flower that is able to connect with the cosmic you know, forces and spread its consciousness and divine love to everybody. So that's how beautifully, you know, consciousness opens up. Now, just on a lighter note, a little bit about exercise, because a physically fit body is absolute necessary for any type of yoga practice, for any type of pranayam technique to expand your consciousness and divine love. You know? And love becomes powerful only when it can expand. Now, most of the Physical exercises that are done are very good for health. They have multiple benefits in preventing diseases, etc. But there is one type of exercise which our gurus teach and it is one of the pillars of our yoga technique, Kriya Yoga technique. In the normal physical exercise, energy ex is expended. In the exercise that our gurus have taught, these are called energization exercises, which are a prelude to our yoga practice every morning and evening, we actually draw cosmic energy. So we conserve and draw energy. So that's also a type of exercise which has a very important role. Diet is important, you know. So we strongly recommend a vegetarian diet for those who must eat meat, fish and chicken are recommended a uh, beef and pork in a no no besides that plenty of vegetables fruits etc so any diet to suit your constitution it should be simple and all common sense rules apply plenty of fruits so vitamins are also important they are available in most of the common you know vegetables and fruits that we consume I just want to make a little emphasis about vitamin D, which is also called the sunshine vitamin, which is a hormone. It is an uh, antioxidant. It has uh, multiple functions. It helps in the reduction of many types of cancers, overall reduction in mortality. And every month you'll see some reports about new forms of you know, activity where vitamin D is important. Even there have been some reports about its utility in patients who actually suffering from COVID infection. 
nuts are important, a handful of nuts every day. They contain a lot of good things for life. I won't go into the details of this. You all know I'm a fan of coffee, you know. So if you have no allergies for coffee, drink coffee, incremental benefits, good publications in you know, very reputed journals. Now I'm coming to the close of my talk because the talk is on love. Luther Burbank was a horticulturist. He lived in a uh, town called Santa Rosa in California, which later has renamed Burbank because of his contributions. He worked a lot on hybrid plants and he did so much work on getting new breeds of potatoes. And in fact, his work was so highly recognized that his surname is now a verb, transitive verb, which means to cross or graft a plant. So our guru became very good friends with him and he used to call him the saint among the flowers. Luther Bur Burbank spent a lot of time in his garden and our guru observed that he talked to plants, he treated every plant so gently and he conducted an experiment with a, a type of cactus and what he said was to the cactus, he said, don't grow your thorns. I will love you. You know, I'll take good care of you. You don't need to protect yourself by growing all these thorns. And lovingly, you know, as this plant matured, they all grew without thorns. So it's an example of the power and importance of using love in your daily life. It is a beautiful example by this famous horticulturist, how he was able to coax with loving vibrations to prevent a cactus from growing thorns. This is the new normal, wearing masks. Fear has gripped everyone worldwide. Business has come to a grinding halt. Daily news gives no ray of hope. How long is this going to go on? Every aspect of what we call normal has been affected. But is there a silver lining? Our earth is looking a little bluer. I believe at least until most lockdowns were in force, 50% reduction in air pollution worldwide, which had not been achieved with this expenditure of billions and billions of dollars. Nature is breathing. We have actually failed to actually take care of our planet. We have suffocated our planet by our ways of life. This is a very interesting map after this COVID crisis came into you know, worldwide attention. A map was drawn. This brown area just showed you a parts of the world where very intensive farming using pesticides has actually occurred over the past many, many, many decades. So this one particular pesticide in concern is glyphosate compound. And this actually disturbs the milieu of the soil. You know that viruses are actually prevalent in everything. They have been around for millenniums. And so uh, this has contaminated the soil. The first upsurge of COVID infections actually occurred in areas where there is high glyphosate content in the soil, North Italy, Wuhan, you know, North America. So besides that, Air pollution, you know, there are suspended 2.5 nanomicron particles of carbon everywhere where there is excess traffic and etc. Again, these are very appropriate size particles for virus tagging. So a combination of severe air pollution, soil uh, contamination, and variety of other factors has led to the destruction of biodiversity and we have actually created a scenario where 
we have suffocated our planet, we have failed to love our planet. So pollution, both in the air, water and soil, microplastic menace, all this, the current situation with this COVID virus is leading to what is called a histotoxic hypoxia, where patients come to the hospital with you know, hypoxia, with a hypercoagulable state, similar to cyanide poisoning. So, so much information has come out this, about this problem, but root of the problem is that we have failed to love our planet and we have really disturbed the gentle milieu that existed. So there's a little bit in it for all of us. When some things like this go on for a long time, the planet, planet gets punished. When decline in universal values and love occurs, there comes into operation or condition, a situation called mass karma. You know, when there is erosion of love, harmony amongst nations, where there is racial divide, where there is racial prejudice, you know, drugs, violence, you know, nature weeps. And this leads to various calamities that occur, like earthquakes, hurricanes, floods, etc. So in this process, both innocent and the guilty suffer. So to conclude, we're dying from our own toxicities, toxicity. We have failed to love our environment and the planet. Let's strive with open minds for human brotherhood. Let's love, share, and forgive all. So I hope that during the lockdown and all, all of you had an opportunity to be close to your families, to do things that you had thought not possible to do before. I thank you all for this opportunity to, to share some of my thoughts. I want to thank my uh, son Anil for helping me to prepare this slide program. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. So it's been a very inspiring, it's been a very enlightening talk, and it has definitely opened our eyes and broadened our views towards, uh, you know, to see the complexities in life and relationships, you know. When the power of love overcomes the love of power, then the, the world will see the peace. That is Jeannie Hendrix. So uh, thank you so much, BNB Albunai, for letting me moderate this session, and which is beyond my expertise. And this is very challenging task for me to moderate this session, you know. And I request you all to... Uh, ask questions to Ba uh, by posting it in the chat box so that I can relate these questions, relate these questions to Ba. And uh, you know, uh, the achieving happiness in life for us, you know, for youngsters who are struggling, is achieving a professional success. And uh, in turn, you know, achieving professional success is, you know, earning money, earning name, fame, and fortune, you know. Sir, you have reached to the pinnacle of that success. You have achieved all this name, fame, and uh, fortune, everything you wanted. What are the, what are the, you know, the difficulties you have to go through, and what is the uh, you know, uh, have you ever experienced failure in your life? You are asking me? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, that, that could be a, you know, big talk by itself. I have actually experienced many challenges. Now, I wouldn't like to call it failure because every challenge is an opportunity to, you know, move on. Uh, if you compare, you know, 
how relatively easy for it was for all of you to enter a platform or for work. When I came to Nepal back after my training in America, there was no platform to work. For nearly four years, I worked as volunteer. I worked at Anandaman Hospital as a volunteer hand surgeon where I used to go one day a week for no salary. I worked at Share Memorial Hospital for almost five years until HRDC opened one day a week as a volunteer, no salary. I worked in Shantabhavan Hospital for about three, four years, no salary, you know. So there was just, I just wanted to do things the right way. The opportunities that were available were very straight jacketed, you know. Jagir khau, eta jau, uta jau, eso gara, be subservient to some senior who actually may be less competent than you, who does not want to work, you know. So those kinds of things existed and I just decided that I would do it. And uh, use the opportunities that came, use the challenges as opportunities. So my advice to all of you is don't actually be fearful. You know, challenges are actually the, uh, you know, milieu, the seed for you to find solutions. I would say you know, young people should focus on excelling in their work. You know, success and money will come in due course of time. If you are honest, I said I would be honest. And um, wherever you are placed, whatever job you have, you have to try to be the best there. Be in the world, don't get the world to catch you. Not hustle. Thank you. Okay. Not well. Guys? Nice. Guys? Nice. Can you uh, hear Mr. me? Sir. Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. You are mute, sir. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Sir, you were born in an affluent family and you had all the opportunities to go to the best schools in the country and abroad you know does this mean that you know the financial security is the most or this is the added advantage to achieve the success in your professional career okay because i'll have to tell you a secret i was not born in an affluent family i was born in an average family and I was born in a cow shed. Okay. My father, who didn't have a complete formal education, was yes, very, sir. very keen that we get the best education possible. You know? So, St. Javier School had just started. And by a stroke of luck, which is also a very long story, different, you know, story. I mean, we got admitted to St. Javier School. And my father was not able to pay the bill in that school after a few years. So actually I studied, I was a fairly good student. So the fathers actually permitted my brothers and myself to study for free. And this, this fact that the bill was not paid came to my <laughs> much after I came back from America and, you know, joking, my fathers mentioned this and then I actually cleared the bill. So, it is, uh, it, I was very fortunate that I got a very good school education and the school, a good school education, I think, is always a head start, you know, I had excellent teachers, so I'm myself extremely fortunate for that. The, uh, the school education that I got is comparable to the best that I could get. And because of that, I was able to do well, you know, I completed my IAC one year instead of two years. I went to All India Institute. Yes, sir. So there are there are lots of questions showering on the chat box, sir. So I'll try to read out all the relevant questions, you know. Yeah, yeah. The first yeah. question is how much minimum practice per day is required to attain a self-realization and it generally takes how much time 
for an average person. This is from India by Dr. Raju Ishwaran, sir. Okay. So that's a good question. Our guru in his teachings has explained these things very well. You know, life is like a school. You know, we all have a human body, but we don't know whether we are in high school or in kindergarten. We may have just assumed a human body recently. So that is the fact of the matter, you know. So uh, realization, I'll just answer with examples. When our Guruji was taking a lecture once, in America, an uh, 80-year-old lady got up and said, I'm just taking these meetings now. Is there any hope for me? And the guru appeared and looked at her and he said, this is your last life. You, you will get emancipation in this life. Now, so you just have to move on. It can be this incarnation, this lifetime. It could be many lifetimes. So it has taken, I told you, 8 million years to get a human body. A disease-free living in a human body with ordinary, you know, uh, evolution takes one million years to achieve conscious, cosmic consciousness. But our lives, most of us have such adulterated lives, you know. So when all those complexities of karma, you know, multiply, it takes millions of years. So the other uh, point is, you know, that is something that is beyond your control. I think... Uh, Always a practice of, you know, a meditation technique should be started in a small way. It has to be very regular, regularity. Don't expect for phenomenon and, you know, experiences immediately. You know, so meditation and yoga practice, the, what our guru teaches is like putting pennies in a bank. You know, you put one penny in your... Uh, bank, you know, it amounts to nothing. But, you know, after 50, 60, 70 years, you know, it accumulates. So meditation and spiritual practice is like that. So don't do a little bit of effort and say, I have not, don't give up. Effort is progress. That is what our guru says. Okay. Sir, is it uh, possible to do this at our age? Course, like, course, you know, we are struggling. We are struggling for our professional success. You know? I was probably busier than most of you for nearly 20, 25 years, you see. Yes, sir. So, uh, once you start to do these practices, your life becomes more orderly. You will be able to decide what is important and what is not important in your daily life. You know, we spend so much time reading newspapers, watching TV, doing this. So many things that you consider important in life become unimportant. So if you are serious about it, time management comes falls into place very beautifully. But definitely it takes effort. I think uh, the, the question that is asked by Dr. Amit uh, has been answered uh, with this uh, answer by Ba. Uh, his question was, you know, how could you achieve clinical and academic excellence at the same time with spiritual understanding? Well, actually, uh, after I returned, you know, from uh, America, when I was uh, struggling to move on, you know, so I didn't weep and cry, you know, but... Uh, I was working hard. I was not making money. You know, I used to live on uh, one room in my old ancestral home with my small children. But then uh, I said, you know, what is there to life? You know, so I started reading some spiritual books. I, the first book that I read was the Bible by Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. That was really my start. Then I read something about written by Vivekananda. Then I one thing led to another until I found my Guruji's teachings, you know. So, uh, spiritual search occurs like that. So, uh, it's a very, very slow process. You have to be motivated. And then finally, you'll find uh, a teaching that gives you a step-by-step -step orderly, you know, uh, instruction on how to proceed, which is the teaching that my Guru gives me which I've been following very, very regularly now for more than 25 years. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. There are so many questions coming in. 
and uh, maybe we might not be able to take all the questions because of uh, you guys are the moderators time. yeah yes sir so the another question is uh, from dr pravin shrestha uh, his question is how do you incorporate power of love into your profession that is you know it's a good question as for us who are doctors this is much easier to do you know you go every day to the hospital and you see somebody who is suffering you know just don't look at the patient as an object with a problem that is what we tend to do when we make rounds we say bed number 23 bed number this in this patient and that patient go beyond that you know try to look at the individual as a human being who has a feeling you know so once you get into that it was so easy to generate these kinds of feelings in hrdc isn't it when you see children who every child who comes there has got a story that tears your heart open so i think my advice to dr pravin would be that you know so as doctors we have very much very much advantage because we have people coming with problems and physical <laughs> suffering to us so it is so easy to connect and be kind yes sir so when you reach to a certain level of uh, success sir, then the is it uh, true that your stress level significantly reduces or that stress still continues or that increases in magnitude uh, the, there is yeah there is one question related to stress by dr susan powdell that how can we overcome stress we work all together for our patient some of them sometimes look at us like we made them spend lot of money they forget <laughs> that we are helping them to get get rid of their problems so how can we convince such people well uh, that is a good question practical question our uh, unfortunately you know we if we had a health system healthcare system like nhs you know in the uk where everything was for free patients wouldn't complain in nepal there is a uh, unfortunately a misconception that you know doctors charge a lot it may be you know prevalent sometimes here and there but technology in medicine has made medical care very expensive unfortunately you know technology is expensive in all the specialties so our insurance systems are actually were very poorly developed so some patient to develop a serious illness requires you know major multiple interventions does incur a financial debt which is sometimes extremely challenging for the family and as doctors i mean we appreciate that you know we feel sorry for them but i i don't have a solution for that now as far as you know the stress that you incur in your practice in problems i think you cannot overcome this until you built into your daily life some practice of some uh, yoga or some pranayam technique where you have to learn to realize and uh, feel you know your inner self you know we are not just a physical body we are a body made of you know physical substances within we are made a body of light and you know consciousness when a physical body dies that's not the end of it we weep and cry we pray you know we know that our dead loved one has gone somewhere that's why the practice of uh, some type of yoga where just trying to sit still that is the first step in trying to reduce uh, stress learning how to sit still you know? if i tell you to sit still without moving for 10 minutes you know you yes, find it so difficult to do now put that into practice and then simple light breathing techniques and the bible is the same in the bible which is be still and know that you are god consciousness really expands in stillness so those are the first initial steps and you are stressed out be active in the open air take a walk all these things so slowly slowly but this kind of practice you might want to move on 
and you will be able to deal with you know those kinds of yes sir sir we are we are all struggling so is it uh, easy to be still at scarcity or is it to be still at abundance I repeat that again so uh, you said that you know whenever there is a stress be still you know then uh, uh, well i mean what yeah. i meant was you know yeah let aside a little time you know because yes, you know, we are basically i also used to be like that a rat race reach the hospital at 6 in the morning there's yes, so much to do so much to do so much to do you no know, i i want to emphasize to all of you that you know a life that has no spiritual focus is a very very abnormal life yes sir so okay. how you develop that spiritual focus depends on what is appropriate for you you know so what i have found in the teaching of my guru is for me that spiritual focus when you have that focus you want to start your day by being still meditating a little bit it could be 15 minutes in the morning 15 minutes at night i never go to sleep you know nowadays my routine is much more intensive but that is the way you start yes sir so how is it possible to have this stillness in the presence of scarcity when you are struggling and you are you know striving for your success you are striving for your fortune so how is it easy when you have already achieved your everything you are already succeeded is it easier when you have everything or is it easier to do it when you are in this scarcity position that is the question sir well uh, i think it is possible to do it in both you know yes sir if, even in scarcity if you are actually uh, following these practices you will realize that the treasures of you know the inner world are far far greater than you know we are like i told you and i talked a little bit before we are immortal beings we once you connect and become intuitive you introspect you try to you know, achieve the uh, super conscious realms you know all these answers to these questions will be answered but if you think you are a mortal being life is all bogged down by only challenges if you don't give time to think like that then you will always be suffering so you can you can have plenty a uh, lot of people i'll tell you a little story about our gurus one of his most exalted disciples who uh, became the first spiritual successor to him after he left his body he was a multi millionaire billionaire he had all kinds of oil reserves he was a you know banker and he was extremely restless he had everything but he was restless he couldn't sit still he was always stressed out and then he attended one of our guru's lectures in the kansas city missouri and after that he followed him and he was able to very rapidly achieve high states of consciousness and he continued to you know be a millionaire and then he also became a realized saint exact opposite is possible you can be a pauper you know you have people in the himalayan crags and you know the mountains and areas where they they clad in a little loin cloth they sit in cold temperatures and they are so serenely happy in meditation so it is possible to do both but we are not millionaires billionaires we are not you know renunciates of that kind we are living in this world we have to play our role i think my advice to all of you is give a little spiritual focus okay thank you sir so there is a question from uh, our own uh, resident dr shubhash shah uh, this question is how to balance our time between work and family at times it becomes very difficult i know it's very difficult so our guru has actually talked on this many times so he says sometimes you are so busy in the morning you can't do the energization exercises that he tells us to do so he says just do a few and then there are so many steps in our you know sadhana there are four pillars in our sadhana 
practice each one, you know, uh, meditation takes easily one and a half hours. So sometimes you have to quickly go over one and give a little time, but don't break the routine. But you know, at night, you always can make time, sleep a little less, you know, you cancel your dinner, you know, you can always knock out some unnecessary, you can't complete your TV serial, have a big fat meal and then say, I'm very sleepy and I will do this tomorrow and I couldn't meditate. You, know? and you can't be a late riser always and say, well, it's not possible. So you have to make a little sacrifice. If you to, these divine rewards don't come so easily. So, uh, many of the uh, other questions has been answered. Uh, there is another question by uh, Dr. Pramod Lamichani. Uh, sir, can you please tell about your most hardest time to come to this level? And which is your most happiest moment? Well, uh, hard times, you know, in Nepal, working, busy, you know, and not making any salary, you know, raising a family with three children. So those were hard times, but you know, I had the pleasure of having plenty of work, you know. So as I told you, I was unemployed for almost four years. So I don't look at it as, you know, it was a challenge which spurred me to do things that um, I would look at, look at that as, you know, golden opportunities. Uh, it has one of the hardest times for me was when we were kicked out of your party, you know, it really tore my heart when I thought I had to close down the hospital. So again, that list in Banipa was one of my very joyous moments, one of my best joyous moments was finding my guru when I found this book in a you know small reading that book led me on to actually the greatest gift of my life so another very very happy moment for me was to have been able to establish this training program where all of you could you know all the trust that uh, all of you gave me you know especially the earlier graduates who joined my program. There were so many you know, aspersions cast on the quality of the training we were provided. We were insulted many, many times by different authorities. And it was extremely painful for me, the way the medical council treated us, the university, you know, bumped me in the beginning, the dean, his behavior, and ultimately, again, what happened. So those were actually very, very painful, but I appreciate those of you who stood by me and who now hopefully can say we were trained under him. We trained at BNB and HRDC and that is my alma mater. Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. That is one of the best residency program that you have ever started in the country. And uh, all the residents that has been produced from that program has been doing the uh, very good in different parts of the country sir so and we are very much obliged and grateful to you and yeah. srd proudly yeah, proud yes, to fly that flag <laughs> yes sir <laughs> and there is one very interesting question sir and and that question is from uh, dr shilabant Srivastav. i'm uh, i'm uh, you know uh, I'm not taking the question by Dr. Lokras because the question that he has asked has already been answered by you, sir. So the question by Dr. Shilabant Srivastav is an interesting question. So he says, Namaste, sir. One famous neurosurgeon in his speech was saying, love is controlled by brain and hormones present in our body. Heart has nothing to do with love. Drama people for their own benefit saying heart is responsible for love. As it doesn't sound good to say, hum dimag de chuke sanam in place of hum dil de chuke sanam. 
in your opinion, which is more responsible for love, dil or dimag? Well, both are responsible. You know, there is an article in Self-Realization Fellowship magazine, which is a magazine produced by my gurus, you know, in India, where the title of the article is The Heart Has a Brain, you know. So this is a question that is uh, uh, pertinent, but at the same time, a little impertinent because uh, to understand these things, you have to read more, you have to be aware of many, many other facts. The uh, astral spine that I spoke about in the thoracic region, which is just behind the heart, you know, that is the uh, uh, spinal center for divine love, you know. So, in that way, the heart does have actually uh, some continuity. Actually, to go a little step further, if you uh, read yoga practices, you know, always people tell you to focus between the eyebrows, you know. The point between the eyebrows is the called the Agnya Chakra. It is the point of willpower. So between the point of willpower and heart, there is a very strong magnet, you know, between positive and, you know, so there are flows of energy that are far beyond what science can quantify. So you have to, whoever asked this question, you know, that is my answer. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So a similar question that has been asked by Dr. Byapak is also, which is the center of love? Is it a heart or brain? So you have already answered this question, sir. So we are not taking this question anymore. The, uh, the another question is uh, from uh, Dr. Bulan Thapa. So he says, beautifully said, we have forgotten our love to our planet and nature. So, sir, I believe there is an entropy balance in nature. Any disbalance in harmony creates chaos. So my question is, who created God or love? And don't you think so COVID virus has created to balance the turmoil world in this pandemonium? Well, there are a lot of articles written in this way, you know, that uh, new uh, world, new way of life, you know, has this pandemic taught us a lesson. So uh, one thing that you have to remember is we are human beings with a limited consciousness. Until your consciousness has expanded to a level where you are using your intuition and super conscious state, you cannot understand lot of phenomenon in nature. Once you are able to merge with the consciousness of super, super consciousness, then nature obeys. Okay? So Bulan, that is my answer, you know. So uh, definitely we have, uh, you know, exploited resources. We have damaged our ecology. We have damaged the biodiversity that exists. There is pollution in the air, pollution in the soil, pollution in the water. And, you know, as a result of that, you know, microorganisms that float in the air, that are in the soil are also affected. And as a result of that, you know, uh, human beings are, are paying a price for this. Thank you, sir. So the another question is from Dr. Prabhat is uh, he says that sir it is very privileged to work and learning lots of things from you my question is that does yogi yogananda school of thoughts believe in reincarnation will he uh, will he reincarnate what did you say yes sir does uh, yogi yogananda believes in reincarnations oh of course you know our paramahamsa yogananda if you are referring to my Guru Paramahamsa Yogananda, these are souls who have actually uh, become cosmic. They are self-realized. So they have become one with the power of creation. So, you know, our souls, which never die, they are infinite. They have always been. So the soul never dies. Only thing is that once you assume a human body, the soul becomes identified with the physical self. The ego works and the, your mortal 
consciousness is contaminated and then and you have to again uh, also accrue the effects of your bad thoughts your karma that's how things multiply so you can actually blend into your original immortal cosmic state only until your soul becomes completely pure so the reinc reincarnation is a fact whether you some uh, somebody believes it or not lot of lot of the things that we talk about in yoga sciences is not a question of belief you know so with a very limited consciousness reading a little bit here and there it's uh, very foolish to say i don't believe in this and i believe in that so it requires realization not just reading and believing yes sir. thank you sir so it is not possible to take all the questions there are lots of questions and many of the questions has already been answered by sirs so i'm just taking relevant questions which uh, has not been answered uh, the question is uh, from uh, dr bimal pande is how to balance family profession and friends and which one is the most important for our life both are important both are important that's why uh, you have to figure out what is important in life and what is not important you know so sometimes it means dividing roles sometimes uh, uh, you have to take a step back you know if both parents are working it is very challenging you know so i think uh, you cannot neglect your family especially Uh, one of the important uh, challenges that uh, modern day living actually has created is the way children are being raised you know there is so much technology at home they get addicted to you know gadgets and uh, children are forgetting how to do those old time honored activities you know being more outdoors reading books eating the right type of food and uh, a parent can't be so so busy that he doesn't have uh, time for his family if you are that busy and you are worried i think you should make some adjustments in your life because family life is very very important okay the next uh, question is uh, i would like to take this question from dr sushil sharma and uh, his question is like thank you sir for wonderful talk sir you have trained in united states how is the practice different here in nepal and as you reflect on your career how you see orthopedic specialty in future in nepal what is the future of orthopedic surgery in nepal your last part of your question is broken i didn't get it properly so america so, and what else so you got trained in united states so he wants to know the difference in orthopedic practice in america versus nepal and uh, how do you see the okay. future of orthopedic surgery in nepal okay see uh, when i uh, i often tell my students you know that the training that we provided here is at least the clinical exposure practical experience the volume and variety of work far far better than what i actually experienced i went through a extremely rigorous training program in america where i spent most of my time in the hospital for 5 6 years you know 6 7 years so it was a uh, learned a lot of trauma learned a lot of reconstruction etc but after i came back here many things that i learned became irrelevant you know so the uh, case scenario here was completely different and i could uh, not i didn't have any uh, backup and uh, you know set up to rely upon so i really literally for 8 uh, 7 8 9 10 years you know i had to work from a box you know to see what is available to plan any surgery so uh, leaving that aside i think the work out here has got tremendous variety volume you make big differences here in nepal to people because our communities are still underserved so in america 
If I had stayed there, what would happen? I would have been alive like hundreds of other people. Were. I think you work in a developed, wealthy society. You are just contributing to their you know, force. You probably do well by working in a place like Nepal. And that is what I encourage. Now, the next question is uh, from Dr. Rajesh Shah, sir. Uh, what do you do to accomplish your goal and what do you do to make yourself better? Well, I think hard work. If you are a doctor, you know, make reading a part of your uh, life. I mean, getting an MS degree does not end education. You know, it's just the beginning, you know. So I always used to tell you all that getting a, getting a minimum standard of training. So after that, your real work starts. You know, you have to get into the habit of reading, you know, and update yourself, learn from your mistakes, you know, keep a record of what you do, be academic, always strive to, you know, publish a little bit, you know, so... Uh, those are all important points that I think you must put into action. So, so the most of the questions has already been answered. And uh, Dr. Byapak has again posted that uh, uh, he says that, am I right or wrong? What I believe is soul is energy. What I believe is soul is energy, mind is supervisor, and body is laborer. We fail because without having enough energy and micromanagement of mind, we are just doing labor. Pretty good allegory. So what is your say on his statement, sir? So we are, we are physical, mental, and spiritual. Absolutely. And most of the times we think we are just physical. That is the trouble, you know. And for most, most people, for incarnations and incarnations, you know, they just actually think they are mortal physical beings. And only through experiences, mostly sad, challenging experiences, people are, you know, spurred on and, you know, made to finally realize that there is something beyond life. So from one life to another, these things happen. And so it takes practice and you just have to uh, start somewhere, you know, and don't look for a flower to blossom from today to tomorrow. A seed, there is a Chinese plant, you know, you plant it, you water it, you take care of it, you wait for one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. And then you kind of say, my God, what a waste of time and effort. And then suddenly in the sixth year, it goes to 90 feet high. You know, So meditation and yoga is like that. It might take incarnations, but if you don't make a start, good thing is, you know, uh, God has so beautifully actually concealed our past lives. We always get a new opportunity to start everything anew when you are reborn again without knowing what you were before. Most of us, you know, our uh, Param Guru Sri Yukteswar used to say, the past lives of most people are horrible, you know. We were killers, murder, we have done all kinds of nasty things before. So God in his greatness gives us an opportunity to restart again, you know. So just uh, remember that. <laughs> Dr. Binato, unmute your number. Yeah? Oh. So, this is the last, probably this is the last question. Uh, the question is, are there any regrets in your life? Something you wish you would have done differently? Hmm. 
Well, uh, my my regret in life, really not. I wish I had found my guru earlier. You know, so my children are so lucky. My grandchildren come to meditation. You know, twice a week. You know, they pray and chant with me, and how lucky they are. You know, so my children at a much much younger age have found you know principles of living and things which I have been able to hear them, but. it took me a while i had lot of doubts when i started because nobody around me had actually so uh, that is my only regret but apart from that i have had a wonderful life i have had lot of uh, you know uh, i wouldn't call hardships lot of challenging situations i have to tell you a little story when i came back from america and applied for a job in the ministry of health i Uh, it took me about six months or longer to get a, a you know purji darbandi you know so i finally went to the vir uh, hospital and you know uh, and then there they said well you got to start as a house officer and my only interest was to be utilized you know so after my first day there where i did did a hazir for one day i came out of that room and tore my appointment letter and i said i will never work in this system so after that the ministry of health actually sent me a letter saying atteri vaira the niyukti deko darbandi ma kaam nagarni kanuni karvai lagu huncha bhanera they sent me a threatening letter like that and i had to hire a lawyer finally for after a year or two the file was sent to the ministry of education you know and once it went there there are hundreds of people who go to study on scholarship and never returned you see mata i went i came back i said use me and they couldn't use me so from that time on i said no government jobs you know i will come hell or high water i will sail my ship myself so my story is a follow up to that okay yeah, thank you so much sir the last question is from my side sir oh. <laughs> so my question is you have taught me orthopedics and you have taught me how to become a good human being sir that is the most important part of my life so if somebody ask me what do you want from your life how would you like me to answer that sir well i what i will tell you is the only reason why you are born as a human being is to realize that you are immortal you are not just a mortal being but immortal the human body is the only uh, physical mechanism god has created which has the mechanics in the spine to channelize energy to achieve con cosmic consciousness so that's what i would like you all to emphasize make a start you know you have to we are born human just to realize that we are divine okay thank you so much sir thank you so so much and we are very much you know proud you know to be your student and we will always remain grateful and obliged to you and we all on behalf of all bnb almunai i bow in front of you sir thank you so much you. for thank everything you. that no, i have. i yeah. i'm very happy that you all have formed this alumni association you know uh, keep it up and uh, be proud of your heritage you know that's important you know loyalty and heritage you know so i'm seeing a lot of faces here of house officers who worked with me and you know so uh, nice to see all of you have a good day our uh, maybe on some other topic some other time we can interact yes sir, i would like to hand over this forum to our chairman dr sanjeev upreeti now okay okay <laughs> thank you thank you sir and thank you everybody and thank you alumni for letting me chair this session thank you sir for your unconditional love your love was unconditional absolutely pure and it led us everywhere and i think i mean all of us are like very very fortunate to have you i mean back in nepal you left america you came back nepal you had so much hurdles but you stayed 
So, I mean, we are all, all ready to bow for all you. Whatever you give us, we, I do not think that we can give you back. And today, I mean, in such a short time, I mean, you taught us so much. I mean, I could not even believe you taught us all of Bhagavad Gita and <laughs> chapter four, I mean, verse 29 about the Apana Vayu and Prad Vayu and how on. I think that's the <laughs> most important thing. And you and the, the next thing you taught was like amazing about, I mean, that book of Paramhansa, Yogananda, you gave us, and it's so hard to understand. I read it two or three times, but today it, it, you made it crystal clear. You know, I hope everybody has read that also. Like Paramhansa Yogananda said, this flowing of rivers and golden man sons and the entire universe. And you also, I mean, taught today about the power of love, I mean, about Mahatma Gandhi and E equals MC square of Einstein theory and the letter to, I mean, his daughter in 1938. I mean, I, I, if I was not here today, I would never had learned that, you know, I mean, Einstein and E equals MC square. And you say, I mean, you put that love in that M and it's infinite and that is awesome. Thank you, sir, for teaching us that. And thank you, Binod, also for bringing Jimi Hendrix, the music, you know, the <laughs> <I> mean, <laughs> and, and power of love. And when power of love overcomes love of power, then you have peace. So I'm, it's perfect. I mean, thank you, sir. So like, what, what else we learn? Like, I mean, yeah, we also learn about Bible. We also learned about Hinduism and and, and I was also, I mean, yesterday I was going through Quran and what I found that in, in 79 verses, there are 170 times love is mentioned in Quran, 170 times. So it's in every, every religion. So love is such a beautiful thing. It's amazing. And, 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 and what Paramahansa Yoganandaji said, like when I'm gone, only love can take my place. It, it, it's such a beautiful, such a beautiful line. I mean, I think, I think I'm not the only one to like that. I hope everyone learns from that line too. And we also learn about Newton and how about the super consciousness and the realm and the state of consciousness are like, I mean, the awake, sleep, super consciousness and cosmic consciousness these words are super duper hard but I, mean, I read it so many times but now i heard and it stuck to my mind so so human body is a gift and we learn about the axis of and the pran and the cosmic consciousness and the law of karma and so many things thank you sir for teaching that today in in one hour and, so, and also about the yug and the cycle of the life the consciousness and the grand center, the immortal, the, so many things, it's, it's awesome. So I don't know how to thank, so I'm, and about the vibration also, how it passes to others, and the breathing, and the breathless state, the chakras, the pranayam, the kriya yoga, and how, how you explained that with how, how Trilangya, you Swamiji, how he, I mean, absolutely, I mean, it's, it's not possible to believe also that he stayed for three, I mean, he lived for 300 years. I mean, so it looks like to me that breathing is everything, you know, so breathing, like if you are hyper, then you may live less. So control that, I mean, the, the breathing. So breathing is everything. And that slide of yours, of the, of the flower, which blows them out, I mean, that only one slide explains everything. So, and then after that, we learn about the exercise of this, that Kriya Yoga technique of drawing and conserving the energy and the cosmic against the other physical energy where energy is lost and two part of exercise. So, and we learn about the diet also. So about the vegetable diets I and mean, the vitamin D and nuts, coffee, so many things and we learn about the horticulturist thing like Luther Burbank and how he was connected with our I mean uh, Paramahansa Yogananda so I mean even I mean he was horticulturistic and an amazing thing and there was no thorn in the cactus I mean awesome and so, 
and we learn about lastly but not the least how to love our our own planet earth mother earth where we live this why covid 19 has to come so that i mean there is decrease in 50% of the toxicity why we ourselves could not am um, stay safe and 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 work against this toxic toxicity and disruption so i mean we we must be very careful about you know loss of love and when planet declines that that i mean the the, the mass karma is i mean really scary thing we learn today so about erosion of love that should not happen <laughs> so i mean and this i mean staying with our family i mean during this lockdown is another thing we are learning today and so many things we learned today sir uh, so i think uh, I, i i summarized and i would like to thank you everyone and thank you sir and i'm really really proud to be one of your first student and providing me all these things thank you sir thank you so much Okay. Thank you, Sanjeev Dai. Over to you, Rajesh. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, it was an excellent uh, webinar. We learned a lot from Ba, ba uh, and it was an excellent moderation by you, Dr. Binod, and uh, and also it was uh, excellent summarizes. Uh, the, uh, Sanjeev Dai summarizes excellent way the whole talk. Uh, and uh, at last uh, i would like to thank all the participants also they had a uh, good interaction uh, they uh, had good uh, questions in this webinar and at last uh, uh, on behalf of uh, uh, our team i would like to thank dr ashok sam uh, who helped us uh, in this webinar in indian participants as well so uh, maybe with a permission from our chair person maybe uh, we conclude this webinar um, sanjeev dai um yeah thank you thank you everyone for your valuable time and thank you dr baskota and our teacher so thank you everyone so that's all i would like to say and we would um, I mean, do the same next time, and we'll let everybody know. Thank you so much. Yes. Ah, Sanjita, should we ah conclude this ah webinar ah ah absolutely? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Answer. Thank you.